Good evening. It's good to see you all here this evening uh, to worship, to uh, sing together, to uh, pray to our Lord together, to hear God's word read and preached, and then of course tonight to partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together. So again, it's good to see you. Um, only announcements really for uh, this evening are uh, just, uh, I think we know all these announcements, uh, just basically be in prayer for, I'm sure you all know, but make sure you're in prayer for Miss Polly uh, McIntyre as she fell and uh, is in the hospital in the, uh, in the uh, not in the ER, but in intensive care, there we go, ICU, and uh, uh, just continue to keep her in prayer, and, uh, and uh, thankfully she, she seems uh, in good spirits and everything, so. Um, well, as we uh, come together again, as we have gathered together, uh, let's uh, stand as we uh, come into the Lord's presence to worship. Again, as we hopefully have prepared our hearts, or let's do so now, uh, as we uh, come to, uh, again, worship and, and hear his word, but also uh, to partake of the Lord's Supper as well. Uh, you may see that the call to worship comes from Psalm 113, again, the bulletin. Uh, that's what we did this morning, and we're going to do just Psalm 100 again. The, most of the psalms in the 100 area are excellent psalms that were used uh, in the time of Christ as calls to worship in the synagogue, uh, and we will continue to do the same. This is something that the Lord Jesus uh, would often hear, and we're going to, actually, I'm going to read from Psalm 100, probably uh, one of the most commonly used psalms in the time of Christ uh, at the beginning of a worship service. So, uh, hear now God call us into worship, into his presence. And Psalm 100 says, A psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Well, let's, uh, let's praise the Lord. Let's take our hymn books uh, and turn to him, or I'm sorry, Psalm 103a. Uh, Psalm 103a, bless the Lord my soul. Again, uh, singing from Psalm 103, uh, and again, A, and please remain standing. Let's sing together now to our God. I would, would guess so. Is that really long? Okay, let's do, let's go for, uh, Let's go for, oh, wow, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> let's do verses, uh, yes, let's do all six verses.
us pray. Our Father and gracious Lord in heaven, Father, we do come this evening to worship, uh, to uh, come and be ministered to by you, Lord. We uh, come to this service where we graciously get to enter in to the worship that takes place in glory as the angels uh, veil their faces from your glory, Lord, but are constantly in worship, proclaiming your holiness as we read in the book of Revelation and as we see uh, that you are worshipped and that is the due response to who you are. Our Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity uh, to meet together tonight again in this sanctuary that you have provided uh, graciously. Lord, we thank you for the work you've done in this church, and Lord, we pray that tonight you would be with us again, uh, for we come to you in Christ's name as children to our Father. And Lord, we do come together now, uh, remembering and praying together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, praying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would uh, again turn over in your hymn book to hymn number 231, uh, our last week singing this hymn of the month uh, for July, Whatever My God Ordains is Right. Uh, again, uh, a, a song uh, of hope, a, a declaration of, of faith, of not, tr not exalting our faith, but the fact that God is worthy of our faith and our trust, because everything he does is, in fact, right. So uh, let's remain standing and let's sing this together. Our uh, reading, as we continue in the summer, just have a, a little bit left now, but is in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, 
as you can see, Ecclesiastes, uh, if you've been here at all, if you've read Ecclesiastes before, uh, is very clearly different from uh, most of what we have in the Bible. The Ecclesiastes is part of what's called wisdom literature, along with the Proverbs, uh, quite a few of the Psalms, and, uh, and so forth, the book of Job. And uh, as we look at Ecclesiastes, we really, again, get a, a contrast between uh, the a biblical worldview, that which we try to teach to our children, to, we try to have our own minds conform to how we should look at all of life through kind of the lenses of Scripture, uh, to see everything in the reality that the Bible teaches us, for that is reality. Uh, but Ecclesiastes really features uh, Solomon looking at the world from a perspective or considering it from a perspective uh, that does not consider uh, the Lord, that does not consider eternity, that considers just what you see in the here and now. And again, I, I remind us that this is the perspective that uh, so many people uh, in the world take. And it is uh, a reason why so many people uh, in the world do despair and of course, run after things uh, that will never satisfy, uh, because again, uh, the world can oftentimes, to our senses and our minds, seem to be pointless and unjust and everything else, and, and uh, we'll see that we're getting closer and closer uh, to uh, wisdom of fearing the Lord, uh, and of course, as we know from the book of Proverbs, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But again, we will look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and uh, about... Uh, again, this kind of perspective. So let's uh, ask the Lord for his grace, and then uh, we'll pray, and we will read. Our Heavenly Father, I confess that uh, this book, for me, is one of the most difficult books in the Bible. And, uh, but this, uh, again, Lord, we know this is your word. Uh, we know that uh, there is wisdom that can be mined from it, and Lord, we know we need your help. Uh, Father, we pray uh, that you would help us uh, to have minds that are st uh, stayed on you and that do see things uh, from your perspective so we can, f Father, not be pushed too far around by the wind and waves that come our way, this world knowing that there is one who sustains and, and stays all things, which is you. So we ask you to bless this time in your word, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So hear God's word from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I'm sorry if I didn't say it's on page 708 in your pew bible if you'd like to use that so now hear god's word from ecclesiastes who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing a man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed i say keep the king's command because of god's oath to him be not hasty to go from his presence do not take your stand in an evil cause for he does whatever he pleases for the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what, it is, what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain his spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is set fully is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity, and I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. 
for this will go with him in his toll through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Thus far, God's inerrant and holy word from Ecclesiastes. Well, uh, let us go to the uh, Lord now in prayer. Um, Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you tonight, Lord. Um, We gather together as uh, we're told to do in your word. And Lord, we take the statement, the promise that uh, where we have gathered together, Lord, just a a few of us, uh, two or three, Lord, but when we've all gathered together, that is your church, uh, for whether that be for uh, decisions and discipline or if that be to worship, Lord, you have said that you would be with us. So Father, we know that you are with us as we come to you by your spirit in Christ's name. Father, again, we'd never come to you Uh, pleading our own righteousness and that we're good enough and you should come because we're worthy we come to you because you've made us children and as children we can come to our loving father who invites us even calls us as we read earlier into your presence to praise you so we have done that tonight lord our father uh we do come to you thanking you for your grace lord we thank you that as christians uh, as those who know the king as those who are children sons and daughters of the king, that we can have stability in a a very unstable world. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, that as our world uh, continues, as we see strife and and seeming chaos in so many spheres, uh, that you would help us, Lord, to realize that you are in control. Uh, Lord, that we are to call sin, sin, that we are to do what we can do as far as it goes with us. But Lord, we are to remember at all times that you are God and you are in control of all things. Uh, Father, we do pray for our country. Uh, We again give thanks for the blessing of being born uh, in this country, Lord, the blessing of living in this country where we can do what we're doing right now. We can meet together. We can read your word. We can uh, hear preaching. We can pray. We can proclaim your your praise, Lord. Uh, You've blessed us with material uh, wealth and other things, Lord, and you've blessed us more than anything with the ability for the gospel to spread. And Lord, we know you've done that through many ways. Uh, We know that you've been with us these last uh, several centuries, and we are so grateful. And Father, we pray as uh, citizens of this country, which is in deep sin and in deep judgment, Uh, Father, that you would help us again as Christians to live as we ought. So again, would you be with us? Father, we do pray for our sister, Miss Polly McIntyre. Lord, we do pray for her. We pray, uh, and again, Father, before anything, we want to praise you for her witness uh, to us, Lord, uh, for the fact that she is so faithful uh, to you, to the church, Lord. Um, Father, we thank you that this fall, uh, I, I, you know the extensiveness of the injuries. You know uh, how long it will take for her to recover. We thank you that she's safely in the hospital. And Lord, we do pray for her, her physical comfort as well. We thank you for the graces of things like anesthesia and medications that can help out to uh, help somebody like that not be in such pain. Um, Lord, we do pray for her. We know she, uh, again, listens to sermons and, and all these things. Lord, we do love her, and more than that, you love her, and uh, again, just thank you for her, and we pray that we continue to, to see her, and that you would be with her, and Lord, we use her as a, an example uh, of those who are sick and hurting. Father, you know the rest of the people that have illnesses and maladies, and we pray for them, again, for their hope in you, uh, the faithful one, uh, the one who is, uh, who has defeated death, that should we and should Christ not return before we do uh, die, Lord, we will all face death. 
uh, but we thank you for the, the overwhelming, infinite uh, joy of knowing the fact that for the believer, uh, death has been conquered and the sting of death has been removed by Christ on the cross. Our Father, we uh, thank you that uh, Pastor Matt and Beth got to have this time together. We pray you would uh, continue to be with them as they're back in South Carolina and uh, just that they, Matt would be uh, and Beth would be ready to go uh, back to work and, and uh, uh, just thank you for them and for giving them safe travel. Lord, we thank you for all the safe travel that you've given uh, my wife even this last week and Lord, all of us as we go about, just thank you for watching over us. And Father, we pray that you'd be with us as we, many of us, get ready to go back to school. Um, we pray for us who are teachers. We pray for students. We pray for parents and grandparents and everybody else. Lord, help us to teach. Help us to uh, be active in the upbringing of our children and grandchildren, uh, that they would know you and be raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Uh, Father, we need your grace for doing this, especially in a, a world that is so hostile to you now, uh, even openly so. So, Father, we pray for that. Lord, continue to be with your church throughout the world. We do pray for believers in places like Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asia and places like Nigeria and China uh, or these absolutely wicked uh, places that uh, where Christians are murdered by radical Muslims or by their government in North Korea and China. Lord, we pray that you would continue to give them the grace that they need. And Lord, that we continue to realize that they do not ask that their, their suffering be taken away. Uh, they ask that you just give them grace to live through it. To uh, Lord, for their, their eyes, their hope is set on that uh, city which is to come, whose builder and whose foundation is built by you. So, Lord, we pray for them. Help us as well when trials come our way uh, to realize that uh, at the worst, you're drawing us to you. So, uh, Father, we pray you'd be with us now as we look at your word, um, as we look at a very serious passage in your word, and as we come to the Lord's Supper, we pray uh, that you would help us to be open to what your word says, uh, that you would help us as we come to the supper, Lord, to search our hearts, uh, but Lord, ultimately to remember, of course, from beginning to end, that our righteousness is perfect because he is seated at your right hand right now. And uh, Lord, not to uh, be too introspective, or for every look we have at ourselves, Lord, may we take 10 looks at the cross. So again, would you be with us during this time? We ask all this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, if you uh, have a Bible, I invite you to turn uh, in your Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. As we finish up chapter 5 tonight, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 13. And again, still talking about uh, sin within the church. And again, I know this uh, isn't a, a fun topic uh, to look over, uh, to uh, deal with, but it is God's word, and we must uh, not be afraid to go anywhere in God's word uh, because we don't perhaps like what God's word said, or it's, it's difficult. Um, it, it is difficult. There are some hard truths, and that is uh, one of the benefits of going through books of the Bible uh, is that you have to deal with everything that is there. You can't just jump over a topic that shows up in a particular book. And 1 Corinthians goes through all sorts of topics. Uh, we are going to have a lot more, uh, uh, several more times to be uncomfortable and feel awkward and all that in uh, services, Lord willing, uh, in the upcoming weeks and months through the letters to the Corinthians as, again, a real church that has sinners in it, so there are real problems there, and Paul deals with them head on because he was a real pastor. Uh, so again, we're going to uh, look at that uh, this evening and continue, Lord willing, in the following weeks. So again, our, our passage begins on page uh, 1213 in our Pew Bibles, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. Uh, hear now God's word from 1 Corinthians Paul says this, starting in verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter 
not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what uh, have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's ask him again one last time for his blessing. Father, we pray that you would bless this time. Um, Lord, again, you know what we need before we ask you, so please minister to us. Help us to uh, have, let your word, let your spirit work in us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm sure we've all heard uh, people that uh, maybe grew up in church or that we invite to church or something that perhaps don't want to come, and, and uh, I'm sure we've all could, uh, would probably come to the same conclusion, my guess would be, about what people most often complain about the church, why they don't want to go. At least in my life, uh, that has been because the reason given has been because Christians are hypocrites. Uh, they're a bunch of hypocrites. I know the people who go to church there, and they're a bunch of hypocrites. Now, while there can be for sure some, some problems with those statements, I mean, we all tend to be hypocrites, and somebody who realizes that there are hypocrites in the church might want to come join us and help us not to be hypocrites, and, and, uh, and if they're meaning that or if they're just using that perhaps as a, a defense mechanism in order to not uh, go to something they don't want to do. Um, the reality is that sin and hypocrisy within the church uh, that is seen within the church, but especially by the outside world, uh, that is seen to go unchecked. Again, if there is sin and hypocrisy, that's just obvious, and, and the world knows about it. So the, again, the world, those outside the church know about it. Uh, it's probably the main reason given by believers for not coming to the church, but it's also spoken against very strongly in the Bible. Uh, it is uh, something that, in fact, we'll see is, is something that the Bible speaks very strongly about and says actually the Lord is dishonored greatly uh, when we have that kind of situation. Uh, in fact, in Romans, uh, in the first two, well, in chapter two, you know, Paul in, the, in Romans in the first three chapters talks about the fact, the problem uh, with us, humanity, is the fact that all of us are guilty against God. All of us uh, are even born, but also continue and choose to sin and turn away from God. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not, if you're a Jew or a Gentile or what you are, uh, we are all guilty uh, before God. And he talks about the, the self kind of righteous religious person who, who knows the law. He's thinking of the Jew here uh, back when he wrote this, but he's talking about that they know the law, but then he talks about you, you know, you preach against stealing, but do you go and steal and rob temples? The fact that you know what the Bible says isn't necessarily uh, the important thing. And then in verse 23, uh, he says this, You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The idea here, he's quoting from Ezekiel, but is that the people in Ezekiel, again, they're in, in Babylon. Again, you can probably notice in the Old Testament there's a lot of stuff written about when they're in Babylon, but... Uh, when they're there, people uh, blaspheme the name of the Lord, Yahweh, uh, the, the true God, because of his people. They look at his people, see them being judged by God, but also see them when they're sinning, and they'd, they'd blaspheme. They'd say, these, these you know, people who follow you, these Israel, these people are pathetic. Uh, they, they were given a, a bad name, and God received a bad name from them. Again, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Well, Peter also, we have Paul, but Peter... In 2 Peter, uh, a book mainly dealing with false teachers uh, within the church, uh, talks about these false teachers coming in, and he would teach that actually, and this was a big thing in the early church, uh, especially if you know the Greek religion, the, all the Greek pantheon, sexual practices were almost always involved with religion. Uh, unfortunately, if you had the 
experience, and I actually did not see the Olympics. I didn't watch it. They'll claim, like, we're just going back to celebrate the Greek origins. That's pagan idolatry in the first place, beside the fact that they're lying and hate Christianity and everything else. Not even getting into that right now. Uh, but uh, you can tell uh, pagan religion, and back then as well, it's not hard to see, that it often included uh, sexual uh, promiscuity and acts and so forth as well. And people were teaching that in the church, that this goes along with it. And the fact it shows your freedom, we're, we're saved, so go and do this and show how, uh, how mature of a Christian you are. And Peter says this about false teachers coming into the church in Second Peter. He says that many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the false teachers and those who follow them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Uh, again, he's saying that people will see this and they will blaspheme. They will uh, look uh, badly upon uh, the Christians, those who follow the Christ, because they'll think that this is what Christianity is. They're, they're people who go and, and uh, they don't live any different than the rest of us. Uh, what, what, you know, what seems uh, to be so special about them or different about them. So again, hypocrisy or unchecked sin in the church uh, is a very big issue, and that's what is dealt with in this section right here in 1 Corinthians. So just a, a very brief little background. Um, last week we talked about, again, that uh, in this particular section, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul is dealing with this illicit relationship that was going on about a man, and as he writes, a man with the wife of his father. So almost certainly a stepmother, you know, if the father had passed away or something else, we don't know, but still something that should not have been going on, and this man was in this relationship, and it was not being dealt with by the church. Um, and presumably the woman was not a member of the church because he only deals with the man here. Uh, but he also uh, dealt with the problem of the Corinthians more generally, the fact that they were, they were arrogant, they were proud. They thought that they were um, very spiritual and really just something, uh, you know, self-righteous, better than others and so forth. And Paul is uh, letting them know that, in fact, they're not, and they're blind to the fact uh, that they're actually pretty pathetic. And, uh, and what is going on there is something that they should be mourning over. Instead, that their attitude happens to be one of arrogance. So, again, that's the uh, context that we're looking at here. Uh, in our verses for this evening. So again, in verses 9 through 13, uh, Paul continues to deal with this issue of, of personal sin, both within and without the church, and how there is really a difference between the two. Uh, between There is a difference, and I can tell you as a pastor, and I can tell you this as even somebody who teaches at the Christian school, uh, if somebody is a member of this church, uh, not just my own son, or, or uh, but with the kids at the Christian school, if they're a member of this church, again, of course, you don't need to be a, a Presbyterian. You don't even need to uh, necessarily be a Christian to be a, a student at the Christian school. But if somebody is a member of this church, I'm speaking of one of the students, uh, I will actually treat them differently than I teach than I treat the other students. I actually hold them to a, a higher level uh, because they are somebody who is a member of this church. I'm uh, our church. Uh, has a responsibility for other people in this church. We take vows uh, when people become church members that they will live in a way that's becoming to the Lord, that they will seek to maintain the peace and purity of the church, and that they will submit themselves to the discipline of the church, the, the session. Uh, we have elders, and their charge before God is to shepherd the church, to give oversight. And when they see sheep that are going astray, the shepherd does not out of love, again, like I said last week, as we, the world often puts it now, and the church does as well, say, oh, well, there goes a sheep that's going astray. He's running straight to the wolves, but I'm not going to say a word because of love. Uh, no, he'll run over there, even though it's going to look ugly, it's going to look embarrassing, it's going to look however it's going to look, but it's actually out of love because he's going to save them, uh, hopefully, or try to keep them away from that wolf that is there to devour them. So again, in verse 9, uh, a church is somebody, as we continue, I'm sorry, in this section, a church is somebody made up of saved sinners. That is absolutely true. Uh, but it's people who profess to have been transformed by God's spirit and adopted into his family. 
So again, uh, when we profess to be Christians, uh, we are professing that God's spirit resides in us. Now again, when we're brought into a group of family, we're saved by grace, uh, and we're brought, as I said, one of the most glorious things, the, the crown jewel of being saved is not justification, as great as that is, uh, being declared just, uh, the sort of declaration that you are in the right. That is unbelievable. I don't want to downplay the fact of not going to hell and being, uh, being declared righteous before God, a righteous God who, when we are unrighteous because of the sake of Christ alone. The crown jewel is the fact that you're brought into the family of God to be a child of God. And again, right off the bat, if somebody doesn't care about that, I just want to be forgiven of sins and I can care less about God, uh, that is an indication uh, that that person is not in the family of God in the first place. Uh, but we're going to get to that as we continue on tonight. As you're brought into the family, however, the family of God, um, there are rules in God's family that God himself has uh, put forward. And one of those rules is that those in his family no longer sin. Uh, one of the rules of the family is that you no longer sin. God graciously comes, he takes us, brings us into his family. There's absolutely nothing that we've done uh, that merits this. We're brought into the family. We are members of the family. That is never going to change. And now in the family, God has rules that you are going to live by. And one of these rules is that believers, uh, people in the family, no longer sin. Now, uh, that might sound a little strong, but I'm just quoting what the Bible says, and we're going to see that in a moment. And if you do have Bibles, uh, I ask you to uh, have them ready because we are going to, I don't usually go to another part of Scripture. We're gonna, I'm going to ask you to go somewhere in a minute in 1 John. Um, I'm not speaking about some holiness doctrine of sinless perfection. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that you can arrive at a point, as Matt has talked about before, as sometimes in some uh, Pentecostal and holiness traditions, that you can attain to a level uh, sometimes through a second blessing or something, but where you never, you are sinlessly perfect in this life. And, uh, you know, Matt has talked about knowing people uh, who have told him that they've gone months and months without sinning. And I, I've talked with Lee and Matt about that again as they have that background. But, you know, ordinarily that means like something like, I haven't said a cuss word in, you know, several months and, and other things. Instead of, you know, even the inclination of your heart, have you ever kind of gotten angry, frustrated, anything? That's sin. That's the sin welling up in you, not just the outward, full uh, blossom flowering of that. But again, we're not talking about sinless perfection here. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what the Bible is talking about. Um, it is the teaching that believers can no longer live in sin. That believers can no longer live in sin. They can no longer be a way of life for a believer. It can't be something that you just do, you sin, and you couldn't care less. Uh, that is something that cannot be true of a believer. That they can go and sin and their conscience is totally unbothered. And again, what characterizes their life is sin, like an unbeliever. And we're going to see that what is taught here very clearly by John is, if that is the reality, it doesn't matter what they say, they're an unbeliever. So again, we're going to see that there are two reasons why believers, people in the church, can no longer sin. And they're simply this. The first one is that God will not let them, and the second one is that the church is not to tolerate it. So first, God will not let them. This is the main reason why a Christian uh, cannot continue to live in sin, why there can't be uh, sin going on, again, as a practice in somebody's life. And uh, here I am going to actually uh, ask you if you have a Bible to turn our pew Bibles, uh, or if you just have your own Bible, we're going to be in 1 John uh, chapter 3, looking at verses 6 and 7. This is probably the clearest place. There are many places, but in the Bible. So again, 1 John chapter 3. If you're using a pew Bible, uh, this can be found on page 1303, 1303. And as we're turning there, uh, you may know that John, uh, I love the Gospel of John. I love John, uh, the Apostle. And you may have heard John is referred to as the gospel, I mean, I'm sorry, as the apostle of love and, uh, and other things, uh, which of course is true. I mean, we look at, uh, you know, Jesus wept and so forth, and that's in John's gospel. So we uh, all want that as a memory verse and so forth. But again, I'm getting back into school mode. Uh, but I did, uh, sorry, I 
Don't mean nothing to say. I did that dream I talked about. I had a horrible one last Sunday night. I'm not making that up either. Had not had one in years, and all of a sudden I have that dream uh, the next night, and it was uh, horrible of school starting back. But again, here we are, 1 John chapter 3. Uh, again, John is called the apostle of love by many people, apostle of joy. Um, John could also be called the apostle of bluntness because he's very, very blunt. Uh, he's not afraid to, uh, he doesn't mix words and, and try to obscure and make things uh, more uh, palatable to people and so forth. So again, here in 1 John chapter 3, starting in verses 6 and 7, you're in the context, again, similar to Corinth of people teaching that going on and sinning, particularly sexually, sexual sin, but this is not just allowable for a Christian. This is what the more mature Christians do. And John is letting them know there is no way uh, this is actually not allowed at all. And he says it, I think, more clearly in this passage than Paul does. Paul kind of just skirts by it real quick. So starting in verse 6, actually I'm going to start in verse 4 of chapter 3. It says, everyone who may, I'm sorry, yes, uh, in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and, there, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So if we stop there for a moment, at the outset we see that one of the reasons that the Lord came, that Jesus was sent in the first place, was in order to take away sins. To continue, to continue in sin is to continue in something that Christ came to destroy, the works of the devil, to do away with sin. Again, we, we often have a kind of half gospel, a truncated gospel as it's often called, but when we talk about the fact that the gospel deals with our sin and that Jesus will forgive us of our sins uh, and that we don't need to go to hell, and again, gloriously, that is true, but that's not the whole truth. There's more to it than that as well, and it's good news. It's not now the bad news. The good news continues. He will rescue you from your sin and continue to make you more like him throughout your life, and then in glory, you will be glorified forever without any inclination towards sin at all, ever. That also is good news in the Bible, not bad news because God's taken away all the fun stuff now. Uh, it's good news that God does this work of sanctification in the lives of all of his children. Now, verse 6 plainly says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one. And again, abiding in him, this is not a, a two-tier, sometimes to get around this, people will make like, well, these are the people in the spirit, and then the rest of us are these kind of second-class Christians who are in the flesh, and that is not biblical at all. Okay, if you're not, if you're not abiding in him, you're not a Christian, uh, is again, what the Bible teaches. But no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Now, actually, in the Greek, it, they, the keeps on here in the ESV and the NIV and so forth, uh, is added in by the translator. Is this literally no one who abides on him sins? Uh, but I think again, as I said this morning, that this is a, a good translation because while it does say literally no one who abides in him sins, the point it, as we look at John, he talks about if anybody does sin, uh, that we have an advocate with the Father, and if we say we have no sin, that we're liars. Uh, obviously, he's not meaning that sinless perfection, like some people talk about. He's talking about here about it's not your way of life anymore. You're, this isn't your pattern of life. What you do is just sin. Uh, you know, what's guiding your life is probably you, and whatever you want to do, that's what you do. Uh, John is saying that is not what a Christian does. So again, uh, no one who abides in him uh, sins. Uh, they don't have this ongoing, unchecked pattern of life. Starting in verse 8, he says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, again, Gospel of John. John uh, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and when they say, you know, we're of Abraham, Abraham's our father, who's your father? Again, uh, throwing some, I was going to say throwing some shade uh, there I was going to uh, use uh, 
too influenced by younger people, but uh, there they are actually throwing some aspersions on Jesus, who is your father? Because again, of those uh, always, uh, you know, people obviously not believing Mary that she was a virgin, but they're saying Abraham is our father, because Jesus is saying, you don't know my father, saying Abraham is our father, and if you remember, Jesus then tells him, look, you're trying to kill me, and Abraham never did such a thing, and then Jesus, of course, pulls no punch. He says, you're of your father, the devil. And his point there isn't just to, to, be, to be either rude or to be kind of outlandish so people would, you know, say, wow, look what he just said. He literally is saying, look, your father, you, how you act shows who your father is. Your father, the devil, he's a liar. He's lied from the beginning. He's the father of lies. And y'all are liars. You're showing that you're of the devil by what you do. And this is what John is talking about here. How you act shows who your true father is. No matter what you say, you see a family resemblance. And believers or unbelievers show a family resemblance also. Is God's spirit in them or are they still of the devil because they're in the world? Starting in verse 9, again, he says, no one born of God. He goes even further here. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for, this is the reason why, God's seed abides in him, and this is where he goes even further, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. All right, by this, it is evident, it's plain, it's obvious who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So again, in his bluntness, in his characteristic bluntness, he says, whoever keeps on sinning, is of the devil. But then, as I said, he goes even further and says, it's impossible. It cannot be done. It is impossible that you have somebody who is uh, born of God, but their way of life is that of sin. Now, how can he make such a claim? Again, as I just said, God's spirit has taken up residence in them. If you were born again, it means that God's spirit actually abides in you. Being born again, regenerate, uh, born from above, you know, having the Holy Spirit within you. Those are all synonyms. They mean the same thing. It means that God, through his Spirit, actually dwells in you, uh, and he works on you, because you're part of the family now, and he will not let you do such things. Now, again, I want to be very clear. Christians can and often do uh, stray, uh, and of course we all have battles that we struggle with, but again, I think the main point uh, that the Bible makes and I want to make is that we will struggle with the sin because God's spirit is in us. Um, when, when somebody sins, I don't, and the Bible doesn't teach we, that person is not a believer because they just sin. It's really their, their, how they react to sin. Can they sin again and it does not phase them at all uh, is a sign that God's spirit is not there convicting them of what they're doing, saying you cannot live this way anymore. Uh, is their heart being transformed so that these are not things they any longer even can take pleasure in. Uh, again, God's word teaches that there's uh, pleasure for a, a moment, for a brief time, but uh, then uh, sin is uh, something that we can't continue in. So again, God's uh, spirit abides in him. Now, I asked Ken about this earlier to make sure that I was correct. I've only ever uh, put out corn for a corn pile once in my life. So, But the idea is you go as we're getting closer to the, the deer season, and you set up a deer, you set up a corn pile, and you have cameras, the best ones all around, to watch the corn pile, and you've, uh, you're, you uh, tell people that there have been bucks all over the place, you know, 10 pointers, 12 pointers, those ones with the weird, like, crown, kind of unorthodox, whatever it's called, uh, the ones that got those crazy horns that are like 50 pointers, but they're ugly, um, just there's bucks everywhere and come out to my land and you can take them. I've seen them on the cameras. Uh, the corn is all eaten up. And you go out there to the corn pile and you saw, let's say, imagine again, you saw when he originally put the corn pile there. Well, you get there now and the corn is all still there, completely there, untouched. Uh, and you go and you look at the, the cameras and there's no, no indication that any animal has come there at all. And, and uh, you, you know, you wonder what in the world are you talking about? And you go back and maybe you say, oh, last night, books everywhere and, and just rooting up and doing everything else. And you come back, nothing's been touched. Again, you're going to say, there were no bucks there. I don't care what you tell me. Uh, as I come and look, there's been no change here at all. Well, again, that's true of the believer in a sense, too. Uh, 
if there's no change in our lives, and again, this is not just walk, never is the Bible, Jesus actually, when he says not, not judge, he's talking about the kind of judging where you're just waiting for somebody to mess up. Okay, we're not to be like that. But at the same time, we can use it as an excuse when we see something going on and on and on, a pattern that's unchecked, to never say anything to somebody. Uh, that's not love. That's not what the church is called to do. Uh, we are to do that out of love, but we're also to do it because God commands us to do it, to, because his church is also to be holy. So again, that's what we do. So the reason that a believer cannot sin and why the church cannot tolerate sin, one is because, the first one is because God won't allow them to do so. Uh, he won't let them. And then secondly, and much, much, much shorter, is that the church is not to let a child, a member of the church, live in sin. Now again, don't mishear me. I'm saying live in sin. This is flagrant open sin. We're talking here about a man who is living with his father's wife. Uh, we're not talking about somebody who, you know, we're, we're, we struggle, we have struggles, but this is somebody who's not, there's no indication, like I said, the deer camera uh, illustration I tried to give. Um, and, you know, over time, uh, being concerned about somebody, or again, just flagrant, flat out flagrant sin that is told to us about people, you know, committing adultery or doing all sorts of things like that. And that's just saying, well, the Bible says not to judge, so, you know, I don't know if they're doing it. I'm not going to look into it because we're a church of love and acceptance. Again, as I said last week, that is taking the responsibility that God has given to the church and particularly to the elders and just pushing out of the way, you know, passing the buck. And again, the cowardly move is saying that they're doing it in the, in the name of love. Again, that's not loving to let somebody go and destroy themselves. None of us would let a child go walk out into the street when a car is barreling down the road because they really want to get that ball because they're crying because we, you know, he doesn't want me to. So no, you go and you grab them because you love them. And that's what the church is to do as well. So in verse 11, back in 1 Corinthians, as we come near to a close here, flagrant unrepentant sin is a serious issue and it needs to be taken seriously uh, with the steps given to us in the Bible, in, in Matthew 18. Uh, but even here, as we see in uh, 1 Corinthians, there's discipline. But ultimately, if you've gone so far as this man had, he's put out of the church. That's ultimately uh, what happens. Now, this is not done uh, to embarrass the person. This is not done, uh, at least with the goal being, they might be embarrassed by it happening. Uh, it's not to definitely feel superior to the person. The Bible even tells us to look to ourselves when we do such, that we not fall into the same temptation. Uh, but it's to possibly jolt them from their slumber that they might awaken to their spiritual danger and be saved. Uh, one man said, the contemporary idea that if someone says they are a Christian, uh, that if somebody claims they are a Christian, that they are, and you're never to question this, uh, this is a very simple statement, but does not come from the Bible, and that is absolutely true. It does not come from the Bible. Again, what do not judge is talking about is this just waiting for somebody ever to mess up, and I got you there, as the Pharisees did with Jesus. But again, we are told specifically to judge in a loving sense of going and caring for others within the church. Now, church discipline can be and has been horribly misused by some people. Um, so has discipline of children, so have husbands with wives and wives with husbands and everything. We don't therefore take uh, the baby and throw it out with the bathwater and say, you know what, there's been abuses with church discipline. Of course there have been, and it's sad and horrible. Uh, but we are to lovingly do so as a church. As I said last week, it was one of the marks of the church. The last thing I just want to say, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, I really am, uh, but in 1 Corinthians is, it makes very clear, uh, and again, for everybody here, you need to be part of a church. Uh, sorry, I said things falling from the balcony. But you need to be part of a church. And as I said, I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but you need to be under a session or elders where you have people that are, you are spiritually accountable to. That is how God has set up the church. If you look at chapter 5, and we just take by implication what he's saying here, when Paul says he's not talking about the world because he didn't have to leave the world, he's making a clear distinction between the church and the church and the world. There's people in the church, that's God's people here, and then the world is everybody else. And if you even look at verse 12, 
when he says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Again, he says, you're to judge people in the church. God judges those outside. Again, I know this is not the, the primary point of this right here, but the idea that you just kind of bounce around from church to church and you're not really a member anywhere and you just kind of flit around and you have no accountability, that is incredibly dangerous and it's unbiblical. Um, I was a Christian for over a year before I realized that church, di church discipline, church membership, which discipline comes along with potentially, but uh, was even biblical. So I wasn't a member of church. I went every week with my parents, but I didn't know it was actually biblical. And then fam found out that actually it is, we are called to be part of a local congregation. So I know the majority of people here are members of First Presbyterian Church. But again, um, when our kids go off to school, uh, when you go somewhere for a job and everything, make sure, make very certain uh, that there is a good church there that you can be a part of, one that uh, will help keep watch over your soul. And the last thing we see here is where Paul quotes Deuteronomy in verse 13. He says, God judges those outside, but he quotes Deuteronomy here. Purge the evil person from among you. Again, this is God's word, and he's saying this one, this unrepentant one, who we'll see in 2 Corinthians, it, it appears that this actually worked, and that this person came back to the church. Uh, when we get to 2 Corinthians, and again, that is the purpose of this, is to not let somebody destroy themselves, uh, but to also uh, save their soul. Um, just as in, in the wilderness, that the, the sinful person was put to death, actually, the false prophets were put out of the, the assembly, so also in the church, when this uh, happens, we are to do the same thing. We are to put them outside, ultimately, uh, but if they continue in sin, but again, with the hope that they will come back. So again, um, let us be faithful by God's grace. Now, as we come to the Lord's table, uh, let us remember also uh, that God, as we talk about sin, we're sinners. I'm a sinner. I'm a great sinner. And I know uh, that God, by his grace, will not let me sin. I might fight him, and I will fight him uh, about certain things that I want to do, but he's going to ultimately win. And uh, we are not to, we are to look to ourselves if there's some sin that we are just holding on to, a pet sin or somebody who we just have this grudge against and we absolutely refuse to let it go. Uh, but we're not to look at ourselves for perfection. That is not, we are to look to Christ. And tonight, if you are one who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if you are one who has uh, turned away from living for yourself or living for Jesus, if you've turned away from trusting in your own goodness and righteousness, to trust in the righteousness, the perfect record of Jesus, uh, you are invited to come to this table. Um, you may know in our book of church order, it talks about the fact that you are actually to be somebody who's a baptized member of an evangelical or Bible-believing church. And that is because the Westminster Confession rightly notes that church membership is biblical. And it might run people, I one time was not able to take, when I was in this time of looking at churches then, I was not able to take a communion at a particular church because I wasn't a member of a church yet. And that didn't make me run away. It made me want to even more be a member of a church. Now, again, you can be saved, but you will be seeking to be in a church if you are uh, a Christian. So, again, if you are trusting in the Lord, you are not perfect, but you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, you are invited to come and take of this table this evening. This is the Lord's table. It's not the table of First Presbyterian Church, but it is the Lord's table. So as uh, the elders come forward. Uh, let us pray and prepare our hearts to partake together of the Lord's Supper. So let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, Lord, we give thanks that it is not us who makes ourselves good enough to be accepted by you, Lord, that salvation is a gift. Salvation is completely uh, as the thief on the cross had nothing to offer Christ, but asked Jesus to remember him when he came, uh, Lord, you offer that same thing to all of us. Uh, you offer uh, eternal life for nothing, for those of us who would come and renounce themselves, Lord, and come and bow at your feet. So, Father, we pray that as we come to your table now that you would uh, bless this uh, this sacrament to us, and remind us to walk faithfully, but remember our Lord is our righteousness. So again, we thank you. We ask this in uh, Christ's name. Amen.
Well, again, the Lord's Supper is a visible uh, sign. It's a visible seal and, and sign and seal of the gospel. It's something we've just heard God's word, but now we can feel and smell and taste uh, this bread and the cup. Of course, the bread, as it symbolizes the, the body of Christ and the blood, it's, it's Christ for you, Christ given and slaughtered for you as the sacrificial lamb that he took the punishment that you and I deserve in order that we can be forgiven and that we take his sacrifice in our place uh, in order that we may be uh, reconciled to God, that he can forgive us. Uh, Jesus had these words of institution on, Paul repeats them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that on the night that the Lord uh, was betrayed, that he took bread. And after having broken, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we'll pass the bread out and hold the bread until all have received, and then we'll partake together. the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Well, in the same way, after supper, the Lord took the cup, and after having blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Well, I'll hold the cup uh, until all have received and then we'll partake together. Thank you. 
blood of Christ shed for many. Let's drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Our gracious God in heaven, Father, tonight's passage, and when we look inside, Father, at our own sin, it's very uh, easy to become discouraged, but Lord, help us to take heart. Uh, The fact of the matter is that Jesus Christ, again, is our Savior. We are not the Savior. Uh, You graciously continue this work in us, but it's not even our sanctification that saves us. Again, it's Jesus Christ alone. Father, we pray that you would uh, continue to work in us, uh, not to make us right, but because you have made us right and because you love us as a good Father. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you would uh, take your hymn book for the hymn of response, uh, Man of Sorrows, What a Name, and for the sake of time, actually this song is very quick, but let's sing verses 1, 3, and 5. Uh, 1, 3, and 5. Please stand as you're able to, and then uh, we'll have the benediction afterwards. See the uh, congregational responses, Psalm 117, print in your bullets, and receive now uh, the blessing of God and the benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.